great orator, a man of considerable political skill, with a vision for radical change in Scotland. And I'm not talking about Alex Salmond. No, I'm speaking about someone else who lived 500 years ago and lived to see the change that he sought, the Reformation of Scotland. Thomas Carlyle, the 18th century Scottish historian, called it a resurrection from death and that the people of Scotland began to live. And the man I'm talking about today is John Knox. John Knox was born on a farm in Giffordgate near Haddington in 1505, although there's a little bit of debate about uh, the date of his birth. Some say it might have been as late as 1515. That uh, made me think back to the time that Angus Walker was standing up at the front giving the welcome and the notices here, and he explained that it was his birthday, his 48th birthday but that for the previous year he had thought he already was 48 and so he'd sort of gained an extra year at the age of 48. I don't know whether John Knox uh, got up one day at St Giles Cathedral uh, to announce that in fact he thought he was going to be 60 but in actual fact uh, he had only just turned 50 and so he'd somehow gained an extra 10 years. Whatever his date of birth, it is thought that his father and his two grandfathers fought at the Battle of Flodden in 1513 and that two of them were killed alongside James IV. The battle of course was against England uh, and it resulted from a declaration of war by Scotland against the English in support of the old alliance with France. Although strangely Henry VIII was at that point supporting the Pope and the Roman Catholic Church against French attacks. As a child, Knox attended local schools. At 17, he was enrolled at Glasgow University and then later to, at St Andrews. And once he graduated, he became a priest and a tutor to the sons of two gentlemen in East Lothian. And it was under their influence that he became interested in the radical new cause of Protestantism. Uh, George Wishart, uh, a young Protestant leader, undertook a preaching tour of the Lothians in 1545 uh, and John Knox heard him and was impressed by his teaching and became for a time, strangely, his bodyguard. And this new teaching raised concerns for Knox about the spiritual state of the nation in the early 16th century. At that time, Scotland was a piously Catholic nation. Devotion flourished. However, the New Testament, which had been first published by, in English by William Tyndale in 1525, caused people like Knox to question the traditional practices of the Roman Catholic Church when compared with biblical teaching. And this led to a growing reaction against the Pope's authority, an increasing antipathy towards the adoration of the elements, the bread and the wine in the Mass, and the veneration of Mary, which many considered to be idolatry. Reform was in the air, but only a tiny minority favoured Protestantism and a complete break with Rome. Uh, George Wishart, the preacher who'd come to the Lothian, the Lothians was one of these, and, and this brought him into direct conflict with the church and eventually resulted in, in him being burned at the stake by Cardinal Beaton in St Andrews in 1546. I don't know whether you, like me, have seen that, that point, that paving stone uh, in the road next to the ruins of the, uh, of the castle where that event happened. And Wishart had said to his bodyguard, John Knox, not long before this, when Knox planned to join him in death, he said, Nay, return to your bairns and God bless you. One is sufficient for a sacrifice. Wishart's execution at just the age of 33, the same age that Jesus died on the cross, his execution made Cardinal Beaton even less popular than he had been before. He was not widely admired anyway. 
for he had achieved much of his power through the influence of his uncle and was happy to treat the great wealth of the church as his own. His private life was adorned by a steady stream of mistresses and he fathered around twenty illegitimate children, many of whom he later appointed to positions in the church. And for John Knox and the growing Protestant band, Beaton came to personify everything that was corrupt in the church and in need of change. So that two months after Wishart's execution, Cardinal Beaton himself was stabbed to death and his body was hung from the window of his room in St Andrew's Castle in a scene probably not dissimilar to some of what goes on in Game of Thrones today. Knox was not involved, but uh, he was a little bit like Saul in the martyrdom of Stephen in Acts 8 verse 1, for he was there giving approval to his death. The castle then became a rallying point for Scottish Protestants, including Knox, and uh, as they holed up in that place, uh, they came under siege. Knox preached to the Protestant forces that were there. His first sermon uh, likened the Roman Catholic Church to the fourth beast of Daniel 7. Uh, he claimed that the Pope was the Antichrist. He promoted the Bible as the sole authority and he promoted justification by faith alone. The siege was broken in 1547 by the French Navy who were providing military support to the Roman Catholic Church in Scotland um, and in their efforts, their own efforts, to stamp out the, these green shoots of Protestantism in Scotland. The survivors, including Knox, became galley slaves and that was his life for the next 19 months until the English government, which was now Protestant, negotiated his release. He spent the next four years preaching in various towns and cities in England, including becoming one of the chaplains to King Edward VI. But the king's death of tuberculosis at the age of 15 led to the succession of the Catholic Queen Mary Tudor and a hasty departure for John Knox to the continent. He then spent the next six years, first of all in Frankfurt and then in Geneva. He led a, a church in Frankfurt but fell out with the Church of England over the form of the Book of Common Prayer. He then sat under the teaching of John Calvin in Geneva, or his name really should probably be pronounced Jean Covin because Calvin was in fact French. And Knox said of his work in that city that it was the most perfect school of Christ that ever was in the earth since the days of Christ. And during this time he uh, wrote the a little pamphlet with the natty title The First Blast of the Trumpet Against the Monstrous Regiment of Women. Now he wasn't talking about uh, all women. It was actually aimed at Queen Mary Tudor, uh, Mary of Guise, who was the regent in Scotland, and then her daughter, the Mary Queen of Scots. He had a bit of a Mary phobia, poor uh, John Knox. All of these women, of course, were Catholics, but this leaflet so annoyed Queen Elizabeth I, who came after Mary Tudor, that she would never ever speak to John Knox again. On his eventual return to Scotland in 1559, he was summoned for discussions with Mary of Guise, the regent, who wanted to determine his intent, what he was planning to do. But within the year, she was dis deposed from her position with English support. The Treaty of Edinburgh was signed, which ended the old alliance with France and established an Anglo-Scottish accord between the now two Protestant nations. The power of the Pope was overturned by the Scottish Parliament and mass was abolished. And John Knox celebrated these events with a national Thanksgiving service at St. Giles Cathedral on the 19th of July, 1560. The following years were a period of consolidation. Uh, Knox, along with others, wrote a confession of faith. Uh, the Scottish Kirk was established under the first book of discipline, which he also wrote. He arranged the first general assembly of the new Presbyterian Church in Edinburgh, where it has been held ever since. Worship was simplified. Evangelism and care for the poor was promoted. Education was reformed. Uh, 
I haven't said much about Knox's private life, but in uh, 1564 he lost his first wife, Marjorie Bowes of Berwick, and he remarried a girl called Margaret Stuart, and this caused quite a stir. She, since he was in, by this time in his 50s, uh, Margaret Stuart was only 17. Nevertheless, they had three daughters together to add to the two sons from his first marriage. In 1572, as he lay dying, he asked his still young wife, Go read where I cast my first anchor. So it seems quite appropriate we had a, another Margaret reading the passage from John today. And he directed her to read this same passage in John 17, from verse 1 to verse 5, in which Jesus confirms the authority given to him by his Father over all people. How he had himself given eternal life to those the Father had given to him. And by this the Son had glorified the Father. And so the Son now requests that the Father glorifies him. But it's probably really the, the central verse, verse 3, that is absolutely key. Where John writes, now this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And after J Margaret read the passage, John responded saying, This is eternal life. This was where I cast my first anchor. A relationship with the only true God through Jesus Christ his Son. There is no historical record of when that anchor was cast. Whether listening to the words of George Wishart when he came to preach in Lothian, or when reading the words of the New Testament, now in English for the first time, translated by William Tyndale, or when he joined the Reformers in St. Andrew's Castle in rebellion against the established church, when he was pulling the oars of a French galley, or when he was listening to the teaching of, of John Calvin in Geneva. But cast his first anchor he had. And his personal decision of faith transformed Scotland into the land of the book. And with those words on his lips, he himself passed into glory. Now it could be argued that we are living in days of idolatry once again. Not a religious idolatry that John Knox attacked, but a material idolatry, in which we are attracted to the good things that this world has made available to us more than we are to Christ. Surely Scotland is once again in a place of spiritual death and in need of resurrection. If John Knox were alive today, what would he see in Scotland? What would he say about what he sees? How would he respond to the recent decisions of the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland, which he himself began. He may well say that we desperately need to refix our anchor firmly in the right place, in the Son of God, in the Word of God, in the Spirit of God. The Church in Scotland needs to do that. Maybe there are some believers who have lost their way a little bit and need to do that. And those who have no faith yet need to do that too. Because without that faith uh, in Christ, without that living relationship with God, there is no eternal life. Maybe you remember the old Boys Brigade favourite. We have an anchor that keeps the soul. Steadfast and sure while the billows roll. Fastened to the rock which cannot move. Grounded firm and deep in the Saviour's love. That is where we, like John Knox, must fix our anchor in the Saviour's love, in the rock that is Christ. Shall we pray?